pleased to welcome Iowa City native Susan McCarty back to Iowa City to read from her short story collection, Anatomies. Anatomies was featured on Esquire Magazine's summer reading list, and Esquire reviewer Matt Patches wrote the following. Judging from the wry observations in McCarty's first short story collection, the author seems like the type of person who would laugh at a funeral, which is a compliment. As McCarty reveals, what's funny is funny, what's sad is sad, and personal moments that pang are often both. Anatomy's syncopated stories follow an assortment of characters, including aging tutors, professional rapists, and New York transplants, as they're thrown off course. Her snark lingers somewhere between Alice Monroe and Amy Schumer, which again is also a compliment. <laughs> Susan McCarty's work has appeared in the Utney Reader, the Iowa Review, Indiana Review, Conjunctions, and elsewhere. She has an MFA from the Vermont College of Fine Arts and a creative writing PhD from the University of Utah. She has worked in publishing at Penguin and Avalon Books, where she acquired and edited Ya, Romance, Mysteries, and Westerns. She is currently an assistant professor of English and creative writing at Salisbury University in Maryland. We're so happy to have her here tonight. Please welcome Susan McCarthy. Thank you. I forgot my copy. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? Thank you so much for coming out. Um, I know a lot of you here, which is really wonderful. Um, although it does kind of, I was saying before, just a few minutes ago, that it does sort of feel like I'm attending my own funeral in a way. <laughs> so thanks for coming. <laughs> thanks for caring. Um, I happy caucus season, guys. Everybody, you're almost at the end of it. I was I was living in Iowa City eight years ago, and. I wrote a little um, dispatch to Boston Magazine about the caucuses, and I just reread it, thinking, oh, I wonder what insight I had into the caucuses eight years ago. And mostly it was just that I thought that the Obama canvassers were really hot. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a terrible column. Don't read it. Um, but I do hope that in this season you have had a lot of um, sexy visitors. That's, <laughs> that's what I wish you, and in these last few days as well. Um, I'm going to read one story tonight, Indirect Object. This is a story I wrote um, that was inspired by my time I spent as an ACT tutor in the Chica a Chicago suburb, which is basically like those two things combined equals another circle of hell. I'm sure you can imagine. <clears throat> so if anybody ever wants to become an ACT tutor, I would say, don't, don't do it, run away. <laughs> Indirect object. The ACT tutor selects another binder from the shelf. On the spine of the binder is his student's name, Mackenzie H. Currently, there are three Mackenzies attending the tutoring center, the others being Mackenzies S and G. What can account for the popularity of the name? He can only think of Spuds Mackenzie, the beer dog from the 80s. Surely this is not the Mackenzie Fountainhead. It's an ugly name, unlyrical, masculine, ahistorical. Later, if he remembers, he will Google it. In front of Mackenzie H's binder is the subject and the book chapter he's assigned to teach her today, reading two. This is their fifth meeting. He's also teaching her English and science, although teach is maybe not the right word. He reads to his students from the book that the for-profit testing center he works for has developed, though reads is not quite the right word either, because the tutor goes to pains to disguise the fact that he's reading the book aloud. What he does is he speaks aloud the things the center wants his students to know about taking the ACT. He does this while looking at the side of his students' slack and zitty faces. The things he says are his own words, but the ideas are borrowed. The sessions vacillate between speaking, the tutor, and taking time to practice tests, the students. Sometimes the tutor asks the student a question. What's the main idea of this passage? Like there's, um, there's the independent, the declaration of independence, and it. The last word stalls. This is one kind of silence. The tutor is intimately acquainted with it by now. What about it? 
Um, it's the Declaration of Independence, so it's about independence and how it's like declared for our freedom. Well, okay, the passage is about the Declaration of Independence, but in what way? Like, for our freedom in the Revolutionary War? No, that's not. Look, in your own words, what's the passage about? A silence so total, the tutor looks up from the book to make sure that the student is still there. <laughs> the Declaration of Independence. And? And our freedom to have independence to be declared. <laughs> the passage is about how the Declaration of Independence was moved to a bunch of different locations. And now it's where? It's um, that last paragraph. He taps on the paper, tap, 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 to crowd out the silence. Oh, um, it's at the, na the National Archive. <laughs> Chive, like the herb. <laughs> it's not that the students are stupid, well, maybe some of them are, <laughs> but he can tell that a lot of them are quick from the way they stumble through the swamp of the language. <clears throat> the way they blindly string together words from the text, the way every sentence ends in a question mark because of the panicked question implicit with each answer. Does what I'm saying even make sense? He can tell they just don't read, and because they don't read, Language does not illuminate for them, it befuddles. So far, not a single student he's asked can remember the title of the last novel they read. He used to ask what they read for fun, but what they read for fun, but not, got nowhere with that. Now he asks what they read for class, but it's as if he's asked them what they think of Wittgenstein's truth function for all the blank looks they give him. Sometimes he wants to ask that instead. If he did, if he asked them, they would try to answer. They always try to answer. They don't want to think about anything. In fact, he sometimes doubts their ability to think at all, these children of the internet, but they all always attempt to answer. For Wittgenstein, the opacity of language was a problem to be solved. The tutor had been writing his dissertation on Wittgenstein, an impossible task his committee had warned him, given the time and funding available. Wittgenstein would have hated these children, probably would have hit them as he was wont to do in his day, but he might have understood their fear. And why should these kids know how to think if no one has ever taught them? That is not his job. His job is to help them score an average of five points higher on the ACT so that they will be eligible to go to college where their academic, if not intellectual, handicaps will be someone else's head slapper. Some version of this narrative unwinds itself in the tutor's head each day he works, which is every day except for Sunday, when the center is closed because the franchise owner is an evangelical Christian. But today it feels as though the tutor's resentment is really given the room to bloom and grow in his soul. His first student, Peter M., is a greasy, stooped boy who makes a game of under-enunciating his answers, and then, when the tutor asks him to repeat himself, Peter rudely, it seems to the tutor, and loudly over enunciates, which gives the tutor the odd feeling of being embattled. But instead of arguing about anything, Peter is only, for instance, defining the scientific method, furiously and with the sibilance of a snake. By the end of their session, the tutor is fantasizing about smacking an expression onto Peter's sack-like head. <laughs> After Peter comes Mackenzie H. in a gold, pair of gold sequined Uggs, the tutor makes a little hatch mark on the f first page of her file. According to his count, this is the ninth different pair of Uggs she has worn to her sessions. <laughs> when it had become clear several weeks ago that his student was wearing a different pair of puffy, aesthetically displeasing boots to each session he had with her and coordinating her outfit based on each pair, he performed a cursory internet search and from what he understands, Uggs, how strangely appropriate the name, that comic book sound of disgust, that premier syllable which begged for its suffix, Lee, were very expensive. Even the knockoffs were nearly $100. The tutor did not suppose he had bought $1,000 worth of shoes in his entire adult life, certainly not since becoming a graduate student 10 years ago. Since the problem with his funding last year, he was, in fact, struggling a bit to buy meat now that gas was on the rise again, he lived a half hour from the testing center when traffic was light. And this was probably just a sampling of her entire shoe wardrobe. Surely she did not wear the things through the wilting Midwestern summers. Mackenzie slumped into the green plastic chair beside him. 
hi, he said, and one side of her face went up as if he'd, given, he'd just given her news about which she was highly skeptical. I didn't do my homework. I was just too busy. It was like I had cheer tries and this city college scholarship thing I had to write a whole paper for, so I just didn't get to read about the different kinds of passages or whatever. She manages to sound accusatory, as if the tutor is to blame for this. He makes another tick mark on the first page of her file. They are never to castigate the students themselves. He would tell the center director instead, who would tell the parents who could then choose to punish or not, since they were paying for the whole setup in the first place. The tutor makes his face a mask and does not give her the satisfaction of his own penal impotence. Penal impotence, he thinks and coughs into his fist. <laughs> OK, the four kinds of reading passages are social sciences, humanities, natural sciences, and prose fiction. Prose fiction. He hated the clunky redundancy. His term seemed to carry with it. It confused the students, although pretty much everything confused the students. Confused students, there was another redundancy. <laughs> Stated as an analogy, fiction is made of prose, just as students are made of confusion. Unfortunately, there are no analogies on the ACT. He tells Mackenzie to do her homework now in front of him. She reads four passages, and he skims them with her so that he can ask her questions about them. The humanities passage is a brutal piece of business jargon, a parody of itself. It is, in fact, completely devoid of humanity. He asks her the main idea of the prose fiction passage, which is the beginning of Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. He asks her to tell him the correct order of events which scientists use to describe the eventual death of our star, the sun. He says, I'm going to read you part of one passage, and you tell me the main idea. In today's markets, leveraging best practices in order to improve margins above and beyond those of the competition necessitates constant assessment and reassessment. What emptiness, he thinks. He thinks of his Ludwig. What can we say, what we can say at all, can be said clearly. If Wittgenstein was alive today, he would definitely kill himself, <laughs> like three of his brothers before him. <clears throat> Mackenzie answers each question without actually proving that she has retained a shred of information from or impression of any of the passages. He gets the notion that she has just been sitting there staring at the test booklet margins for 15 minutes rather than reading the passages. When he asks her a question, her eyes skitter panicked across the page, and she spits out words as she sees them in the text topping from one important sounding word to the next, stringing together sentences with incorrect prepositions, running across the bridge of her answer as it collapses under her. This is how it goes for an hour. As she sulks out of the room at the end of their session, her Uggs wink at him under the fluorescence as if they are flirting with him. And he sees in a flash how she will grow up to be a selfish and incurious adult, probably while making a lot of money. How she would trade her Uggs for breathtakingly expensive heels and pay someone to wax her pubic hair. He sees the pink cocktails. Maybe she would aspire to appear on The Bachelor. She might make, <laughs> she might make a good bachelorette. He can see she will perform the signs of cultural femininity without being particularly attractive, yet she will read to other adults as attractive even if her skin is orange and her lips too pink. He makes his final marks on her chart and puts her binder aside. He picks up the next binder in his pile, makes a mark on the front page of his chart, and waits for the next client to appear. The tutor pokes his head out of the tutoring lab and scans the waiting room. It is Tuesday at 4, Peter's usual time, but no Peter. He sits at his tutoring table and draws lopsided prisms in his notebook. He draws a dog sitting, a side view. He draws a car that seems to be going somewhere but isn't. He draws a crude map of the world and fills in the continents so that they look like little turds. He puts a dot in the middle of the North America turd. You are here. Here you are. Here. The sound of students saying stupid things is all around him, choking him. The air is out of the room, which smells strongly of pencil shavings and reheated meat gravy, which wafts out into the tutoring room from the kitchenette. He puts Peter's binder back and tells the front desk he's a no-show. When he gets home, the tutor eats a frozen pizza and watches The Apprentice, and feels superior to the vapid, conniving people in the show, 
to the dummies watching the show, to the people who are tricked into thinking they feel anything for the connivers, who are not people as much as caricatures of people, people like that. He watches TV and feels superior to practically the whole country, which is the only way he knows to make up for the loneliness. Peter misses another session, and the tutor is called into the office by the enigmatic <coughs> Evangelical Learning Center franchise owner. Listen, there's a problem with Peter. A problem? Inexplicably, the tutor's pulse quickens. He won't be coming in anymore. OK. The tutor wills him to say more, but the franchise <coughs> owner stops there, with his mouth halfway open, as if wondering whether he should continue. The tutor prompts him, uh, is it something I've done? The franchise owner closes his mouth and puts out his hands. No, no, nothing like that. Uh, Peter died. Oh, I wasn't going to tell you, but why not? What? Why weren't you going to tell me? I guess I don't know. I'm not sure I thought it was appropriate conversation for the workplace. OK. Uh, but here's the thing. Here's why I'm telling you now. Parents want to meet you. Me? Yes, well. They're grieving and they want to, you know, they want to hear about their son. They want you to tell them about Peter. How did he die? Oh, I know. That's not something we ask here. When do they want to meet me? Tomorrow. I've scheduled you for a 4 o'clock session with them. A session? Yeah, just pretend it's a regular tutoring block. <laughs> Out there? The tutor gestures at the open room full of laminated particle board tables and mismatched plastic chairs with aluminum legs. On each table is an oversized clown-colored stopwatch. A tutor must use the stopwatch, never his phone or her own wristwatch, to proctor exams and practice tests for students. The franchise owner shrugs. Where else could I put you? I don't know if I'm comfortable with this, but that is not exactly true. It would be more truthful to say the tutor does not feel anything about this or Peter or his parents, including compassion, empathy, or any kind of largesse of sentiment. Technically, it is this feeling, this lack, that makes the tutor uncomfortable. But you knew Peter best. The best of whom? The tutor could not conjure Peter's face. Then he pictures himself slapping Peter, and there, there's the face. <laughs> OK. Tonight, it's dancing with the stars and two half-hearted rounds of masturbation. The parents are ashen elsewhere to themselves, but entirely present to everyone else in the room. Their presence is alarming to the other tutors who know why they're here, and to the students to whom the appearance of parents, foreign, awkward, and uncomfortable, not to mention oversized for the scale of the room and the furniture in it, in the tutoring center was formerly unthinkable. The tutor shows them to one of the open tables where he may or may not have worked with Peter on lab methodologies or on the differences between subject and object. I love you, he had said once antagonistically to Peter, who had continued to stare at the table, but with a new, slightly different kind of veiled anger. What? It's how to remember the difference. I is the subject because I am loving, and you is the object because you are being loved. You is the object of my affection. It is, I mean, I am. The tutor's stomach shrank a little. No, I didn't mean you, you. I meant... He remembers the hard little sneer on Peter's face and sees now how it was birthed from the larger unconscious sneer of his father. The father is wearing some sort of heavy furred coat, it may be cashmere or lamb's wool, and looking incredulously around the room like he detects a shit smell. The man puts a large hand on the fake wood grain on top of the trapezoidal work table. This is where he learned. Ha, the tutor wants to say, ha 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 ha. <laughs> Sit. He pulls out the two small green plastic chairs for them, and because the chairs are short, sized for children, Peter's parents lower somewhat unsteadily. Wait, booms the father, startling the mother who has only just regained her balance. Where did Peter sit? The tutor puts his hand on the back of the wife's chair and accidentally touches the valley of her spine, which is knobbier than her general maternal physique suggests. Here, he sat here, and I sat where you're sitting. Get up, says the father to the mother, who still has not spoken and even now does not. There is hardly even a question in her eyes as she rises, steps to the whiteboard on the wall, and leans against it, 
clutching herself like a person drowning in a dream. The father swings his hips into the other chair and parts the open and pats the open seat in front of the tutor. Teach me, he says. And so the tutor sits down beside the grieving, sneering father, picks up a reading curriculum binder and begins to speak. When they leave, the tutor notices that the dry erase marker from the whiteboard has transferred onto the mother's camel coat, the padded shoulder of which now reads backwards, whom. To whom, with whom, for whom, the tutor looks to the whiteboard, but the preposition has been wiped away entirely. The tutor does not know how to receive the father. That is to say, he doesn't mean to make the ambiance in his apartment romantic, but there is no other readily available model for how to host, at least not available to the tutor. So when the father knocks on the door, a stick of incense and some candles are flickering in various corners of the room. The tutor's speakers shed John Coltrane's a love supreme into the air around them. <laughs> The tutor says, come in, and he sweeps his arm over the dingy vista of his apartment. He says, have a seat, thinking the father will choose to sit at his small table in the kitchen because that's where the tutor usually sits. But instead, he goes to the couch. Besides the couch, a crummy brown chenille thing he'd picked up at Goodwill. There are only two, the two kitchen chairs. To get one and plop it down near the couch while, while there's all that perfectly good couch real estate, all those cushions where the father isn't sitting, seems rude and alienating. But in equal parts, joining him on the couch seems overly familiar, too close. The tutor knows he can't hesitate for too long or his guest will begin to feel awkward, so he does the easiest thing and perches lightly on the other end of the couch. He sees that Peter's father has unfolded and is now carefully smoothing his cloth handkerchief onto his lap, as if he is a dinner, as if he has a diner at a reasonably nice restaurant instead of a stranger in a soupy smelling one bedroom apartment. The gesture makes the tutor extremely nervous. Thanks for penciling me in. I'm sure you're on a tight schedule. The father reddens, embarrassed by the obviousness of his platitude. The tutor and his apartment are clearly not on a very tight schedule, <laughs> at least not one that involves, say, working to make money. <laughs> and I'm, I'm very glad you've been able to host this meeting. I want, you to, I want to do you a favor and cut right to the chase. <clears throat> My son, the man drops his eyes to his lap and swallows. Were you and my son involved? The tutor blinks and feels warm all over. Then he shivers, then he is warm again. The man will not make eye contact with him. He just sits there in his fuzzy black overcoat with a hanky on his lap like a lunatic. The tutor feels set up. The father, on the voicemail from two days ago, had sounded lost, weak, in need of something that only the tutor could provide, some strange measure of tutoring solace, which was why the tutor had called him back. The tutor began being moderately uncomfortable with the situation, but al also in possession of a modicum of human empathy and also somewhat bored. When the father speaks again, his voice is low and he seems to be having trouble catching his breath. I found his notebooks, his school notebooks and his ACT notebooks from tutoring with you. The man reaches into a briefcase at his feet and pulls out three spiral bound college ruled pads, hands them to the tutor. The one on top is open to a page where Peter has penciled the equation for Newton's universal law of gravitation. The equation and its labels are orderly, but in the margins of the notebook, in 20 different styles and scribbled at all angles, is the tutor's full name, over and over again. Here in cursive, there in block letters, filled in with horizontal stripes, shiny with graphite. In the notebook below it, there are some grammar notes from one of their sessions. There is the phrase, I love you, with its subject and object labeled. Under that, Peter has written a series of sentences under the heading indirect object. I want to give him my love. I want him to love me. For him, I would do anything. Will he give me his heart? Then further down the page, an impressively vain sketch of a spurting cock. The tutor feels heavy, as if impossibly the gravitational constant has increased. No, I didn't, I mean, I would never. <coughs> there is more stammering, which the tutor realizes with frustration makes him sound guilty. He takes a breath. Listen, I had no idea your son had these feelings. I can't even. Nothing like this ever occurred to me, okay? This isn't me, though clearly it was. Maybe someone else. The father regards him silently for a long moment. 
I believe you. When we found these, we hired an investigator. He's done a thorough background check on you, and Peter's phone and email turned up clean, and the setup at the center was so out in the open. You've been investigating me. He was my son. The couch pings, and the tutor looks up from the notebooks to see Peter's father has moved closer to him. The man shakes slightly. The tutor smells his sweat. The first side of the record has ended. I need to ask you. This is going to sound very odd, but I didn't come here to threaten you. I wanted to, well, my son, he felt love for you or something like it, and he's gone now, and it's somewhat my fault. Maybe, here the man's voice cracks and he begins to cry, maybe very much my fault. The tutor puts a hand on his shoulder because what else can he do? The man takes the hanky off his lap and presses it against his face, puts it down again, turns back toward the tutor and says, can I kiss you? And then they are kissing, the father closing the distance without waiting for an answer, the hard fact of his teeth behind his lips pressing painfully against the tutor's mouth, and then the invading tongue. The tutor puts his hand on the man's wet, rough face, but does not push it away. The kiss ends and the silence between them seems filled with possibilities, some exciting, some frightening, many a mix. It pulses like a heart or a star or something large in flight. And then the man is rustling through his apartment toward the door and his handkerchief has fallen to the floor like the trifle of a damsel and then he is gone. Mackenzie H's Uggs are purple suede today. The tutor's seen them before, which seems to indicate that she has cycled through her entire collection for now. The tutor is feeling off kilter. He sometimes get a whiff, gets a whiff of Peter's father, whose scent seems to be lingering in some crease somewhere, a layer, silver and sharp, over a musk, the salt of a body, stratosphere and troposphere. The tutor taps out the dactyls with the toe of his shoe. He and Mackenzie are supposed to review some basic terms from biology. Mackenzie looks at the list and says, I don't remember any of these. You don't really need to know them. You just have to read very carefully. The science test is really just another reading test. Read the passage in the workbook. She reads the passage. Now tell me something about what alleles are and why they're important. She sighs. I don't know. Anything. They're for genetics. She looks at him and he nods. For the recessive ones, or like the dominance. He puts his pencil down and takes a deep breath. All these children filling the air with their language. He thinks of Peter, of his inscrutability and his low, quiet voice. Peter already disappearing, disappeared. <laughs> Wittgenstein is suddenly in his mouth. What we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence, says the tutor. What does that mean, asks Mackenzie. Think about it. I think it means, no, don't answer. Think about it. Mackenzie doesn't say anything more, which he takes as participatory. Close your eyes, he says, and presses the button on his stopwatch. This is weird, she says. And he shushes her again, and she is quiet again, and he sees her eyes really are closed, and so he closes his too. Thank you. Susan, I hope you don't mind if I jump in and ask the first question. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did your stories, which most or all were published elsewhere, how, how did they come to be in this beautiful, amazing collection? The, the concept, the design, the illustrations, <coughs> the, the groupings of stories mm -hmm. under headings. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just overwhelmed. Um, yeah. It, <laughs> How did this come to be? How did you Thank you. develop I, this idea? I am also overwhelmed, um, mostly because it was not all my idea at all. <laughs> um, actually, I had probably 90% of a finished manuscript, and, um, and the editor at aforementioned, uh, aforementioned Productions, Carissa Halston, had sort of read some of my work online, and we'd been corresponding uh, via email and just friends of friends and sort of knew each other from the internet. And she eventually, she knew I was shopping this story around, um, that my agent was shopping it, and it was sort of getting no traction. And so she eventually asked if, if she could have a read of it. And, um, and I said, sure, that's really sweet of you to ask. And she took it and 
without even, I had not even agreed to or signed a contract with her yet, but she like edited it and arranged it and did the cover and found these illustrations, these amazing illustrations that are inside. And she's like, here's what your book would look like if you would publish with us. <laughs> and I was like, that is amazing, yes. <laughs> so it was, it was just really awesome. I mean, Carissa had aforementioned um, was just, she's a design nerd, obviously, and she's a, an excellent editor, and she really had the vision for this book that I feel like all authors, you can only take your book so far, right? And then it's like you need someone who can sort of midwife it and has the vision for it because you're like out of vision at a certain point. And she did, and so she she really like seduced me with, with her vision. I'm glad you said yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. <laughs> Questions for Susan or comments? Has anyone read the book? <laughs> uh, Hi, I was under the impression that the book had several stories, or mostly the stories had to do with body parts? Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of, yeah. I kept waiting for the body part. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was, a <laughs> <laughs> there was, yeah. <laughs> it was in there quickly, but yeah, well, I think that the book, for me, the stories in the narrative, in the book really grow out of, the narratives grow out of the body. So I think for me, for the story I read, especially the, the story of, uh, like a grief-stricken father and this sort of confused, poor, poverty-stricken tutor, um, that the way that that conflict or the way that those emotions find find expression is through this strange connection of their bodies in this certain way. And so I think for me a lot of the stories are, are sort of have that moment of connection or conflict happens through the body. And in a sort of sense that like, there's not really words for what's going on here, but bodies, bodies touch bodies and do things to bodies, and that's, and that's the sort of only expression that, that these characters have for their issues. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Sue. Hi, Jacob. <laughs> how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm just chilling. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did read your book. Awesome. I got it for Christmas. Aww. I wanted someone else to buy it for me. <laughs> <laughs> But I really enjoyed it. Uh, what I was you. curious about, you know, most of the stories are either taking place in Iowa or Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm, like you said, this story is about a, a male tutor, but it's still rooted in your own experience as an ACT instructor. And so I, I got a strong vibe of a lot of this is rooted in autobiography. Like, mm -hmm. obviously, this isn't a memoir, and a lot of this is fictionalized. I'm curious as to what's the split between straight autobiographical experience and how, or just you took an experience and just kind of ran with it to. I mean, it's. I guess it's not an important question. I'm just curious how fictionalized yeah. these stories are. Well, it's an important question to me for sure because a lot of these stories, as you know, come from um, my own personal experience, and that's a question that I'm always wrestling with in my writing and in my teaching. Is what is that line between fiction and nonfiction, and and what's okay? What can pass through those boundaries? What's okay to pass through, and what's not? And I'm really interested in genre. You might remember from us, from our classes we I took remember. together at Utah. <laughs> yeah, that um, that I'm really interested in these ideas of that boundaries, that stories or types of writing have boundaries, and I'm interested in breaking those or figuring out what the edges of those are and kind of pushing on those. And so, I think um, there's a lot of autobiography in here, but there's also a lot of fiction mm -hmm. to the point where um, I think my own mother <laughs> is quite convinced uh, that. She recognizes some of the characters, but I sure reassured her that she does not. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, so I think that there's, uh, you know, like the Tudor story, that's not, the actual interaction is not something that happened, but the backdrop is very real. So I think I definitely use like setting, uh, I use a lot of real setting and a lot of setting drawn from real life and sort of use that as the backdrop for then fictional, fictional occurrences. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'd answer it. <laughs> <laughs> Ish. I didn't have a follow-up question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else?
Uh, what are you working on now, Susan? Thanks. Um, I'm finishing up a novel that is actually set uh, during the 2008, 1993 and 2008 Iowa City floods. And in our audience tonight <laughs> is Kate DeCherry, who read here a little while ago, who's amazing novel, debut novel, The Fine Art of Fucking Up, is also set in Iowa City during the 2008 flood, and it's set around the, the art school, so I re read that book. It's very funny and wonderful. Um, the novel I'm working on is sort of, um, it, it's sort of looking at genre and the ways in which genre um, affects these two characters. One character sort of decides to move home after reading a romance novel and being inspired by it. Another character decides that um, their mutual friend has been murdered uh, and he must go find her murderer and he's a big mystery fan so again my interest in genre kind of comes in and these characters follow these genre stories that take them the wrong places entirely right so uh, a lot of conflict arises because of their sort of misreading or misunderstanding of the genres that they're in and and then the realism of the flood and the realism of the 2008 ho housing market crisis sort of kind of start crusting in and, and ruining their lives. So that's it so far. <laughs> Thanks. So, so um, what, what was it like writing a novel compared to writing, I mean, over what period of time would you say you wrote this book, or the stories in this book? I think probably about six years. Six years. And, and, I pr and they didn't, they weren't, I wasn't thinking this is going to be a collection right. at the beginning, so that it's very much sort of, Oh, this fits and this fits and kind of pulling together. So you together. wrote like a piece here, a piece there, mm -hmm. and put them together in the collection. Yeah. So how has writing a novel been? You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard, right? It, it, to keep it all in your head, and it's been a very slow process. And uh, unfortunately, <laughs> with teaching, you know, there are certain parts during the semester that you just get, so you can't get any writing done, and, and life happens. And and so I think that the big difference is. Um, it's that sort of sense of continuing the tension. You know, you figure out your tension in a short story and you're like, yeah, that's interesting and suspenseful and that works. But with a novel, you have to keep doing it and it's exhausting, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> so, so are, do you, I mean, do you enjoy writing the novel or the short story? Do you feel like one is your home and one is sort of an adventure? I think right now I feel like the short story is my home because I did it. <laughs> and maybe when I finish the novel, that'll feel more like my home. But it does feel, and and the novel is is home, right? Like it's a it's this metaphorical home for all of us who are readers and writers. So I'm I'm working on it. I'm trying to make it my home, dressing it up, you know. <laughs> Thanks. Very excited. Uh, unless I, I may have missed it. I apologize. So this is what it seemed you referred to the what as uh, the tutor rather than uh, naming the person. Yeah. And I just wondered why. Um, that's a good question. I, you know, he didn't, his name didn't come up, and I think it was because, like, sort of in opposition to the names that really bother him, like Mackenzie, whose name he does not understand or appreciate. I think uh, I didn't intend not to name him, but I think as the story went on, it sort of seemed better not to name him. Um, and also, he's sort of a stand in in some. Not the really terrible parts. <laughs> it's, he's sort of a stand-in for me, so leaving him nameless was a little bit, um, a little bit of a way to keep myself in the story and keep the story feeling close uh, to me. Thank you. Great questions, guys. I do have a follow-up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> This is just a logistical question. Uh, so, um, you mentioned you wrote these stories over six odd years or so. Mm -hmm. um, so, were there other stories you wrote that did not make this collection? Was did a theme suggest itself to you as you were picking stories, or mm -hmm. did you come up with a theme first and then pick the stories that seemed to fit in with it best? Mm -hmm. Or how, how did that process go about <laughs> selecting stories? Yeah, I think I think I'd written a bunch of stories, and then a theme did sort of suggest itself, and I and I thought, oh, that. Um, this is what I'm interested in. This seems great. The story, the collection that I turned into my editors was actually called had a different title, but an early working title was Anatomies. And so, I think in sort of in the middle of writing it, I had compiled maybe half of the pieces, and I thought, okay, here's my theme, and here's where I want the collection to go. And then I wrote 
probably the rest of them with that in mind. So a little bit of both. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Any more questions or comments for Susan? Hi, Susan. Welcome back to Iowa City. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> I tell you, it's really cool to hear you talking about your writing here in Iowa City and Prairie Lake. So, um, I'm not a writer, so this is probably not a very good question, but when I write, I am trying to figure things out. So how much of your writing is trying to figure things out and how much is telling stories because you're a storyteller? I love that. Yeah, you're not a writer, you're just a surgeon, which anybody <laughs> could do. Um, <laughs> Um, that's a great question. For me, it's all figuring it out because I, I, that's the interesting thing to me, writing is like solving a puzzle, figuring out what comes next. And I, had, I think that's one reason I'm having a hard time with the novel is because I sort of have it plotted out. And so it's hard to keep, sometimes keep interested because that's the fun of writing is the surprise of writing into something that you're not expecting. So yeah, that's, yeah. thanks. <laughs> So, hi, Susan. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> um, so many of these stories are uh, back and forth between Manhattan and Iowa City. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering how many years does it take until we see Utah and uh, <laughs> Maryland? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> give another couple years. And <laughs> but I think that what I really, I, I lived in, I'm from Iowa City, of course, and then I moved to New York, but then I moved back to Iowa City for a couple of years uh, before moving to Utah. And that back time really gave me this cool, like, I saw Iowa City, I felt like I was seeing it for the first time or seeing a new Iowa City that I didn't know growing up. And so that really, I think, gave me a lot of space to understand the move I had just made and the differences between the two places. So, yeah. Great questions. My question is about the intersection of the autobiograph autobiographical and the fictitious. Mm -hmm. um, is that a, a natural intersection for you? Is it, um, does one flow from the other? Does it feel forced? Uh, do you come up with the fictitious part first and then the autobiographical elements filter their way in or vice versa? Yeah, vice versa, I think. I think that I start, well, I usually start with a line or an idea or an image for a story and then like stuff that's happened to me sort of that matches up with that line or that image sort of s that's where I take the story and then and then again I sort of need the setting or some kind of baseline of autobiography and then I jump into the fiction from there so it's kind of a layering I think if that makes sense <laughs> Anyone else? If not, the book is Anatomies, and let's thank Susan McCarty. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming out and caucus.